Um, thank you all for coming. This actually uh, reprises uh, an epic confrontation that Dad and I had in Ron Jordan at the end of uh, October when we were both participating in a conference on, um, on foreign fighters. Um, I've updated mine very slightly. And the end of October was, of course, about three weeks before the attacks in Paris, uh, several weeks before the attacks in San Bernardino. So I've only glancingly adjusted that. And you can see the, um, I wouldn't say the full version of this, but uh, a probably prudently redacted one in the sense that it's only about nine pages uh, to read in the current issue of uh, the National Interest. I also had submitted that to the National Interest on November 1st, so you get it. As Dan and I would just say, if it, had been, uh, it would have looked better if it had been published a couple of months earlier than it did, but it was, it was, it was talking about a phenomenon that has only be, seems to have become more intractable. This is the new sort of normal. Um, that's what FBI Director James Comey observed uh, this past July following uh, the disruption of a variety of ISIS-related plots in the United States that resulted in the arrests of uh, 10 individuals. Here, while the threat of homegrown violent extremism uh, by either ISIS or Al-Qaeda-inspired individuals is largely accepted as a matter of fact, there's surprisingly much little consensus even in this room at the front of the Mortara Center's uh, conference facility, uh, there's a little consensus on a potentially far greater danger of radicalized Western fighters returning to their countries of origin or their natives or their adopted homelands to carry out terrorist attacks. Inevitably, the Afghan, the Arab Afghan exemplar of the 1980s, is invoked to um, to justify. Uh, this potentiality, in other words, the foreign fighters, the wandering Mujahideen, um, that was the subject actually of a 1993 analysis, which was the first U.S. Uh, government intelligence community analysis written by Gina Bennett, who Dan and I have known for a, a long time, many of you may know, um, currently in that Showtime um, documentary about the former directors of, of the CIA. Um, she wrote the first, in fact, Take 546, that's one of the assigned readings, is that analysis where in 19, August 1993, just before Labor Day, a period of time that not everybody may have been paying attention terribly much to their inbox, she identified the potentiality of people that had trained and fought in the Afghan war against the Soviet Union uh, remaining quite radicalized and directing their attentions and their violence elsewhere. As we know, the her warnings were largely um, uh, ignored. Comey himself cited precisely this concern in a May 2011 interview that he gave. And it seemed to be that his concerns were well validated because within a couple of weeks there had been an attack on the Jewish uh, Museum in Brussels um, by a Frenchman who had also fought um, in Syria. And this seemed to validate uh, Director Comey's concerns. But at the same time, this wave of what I've described in this article, and we'll see why at the end, I describe as boomerang attacks of violence by returning foreign fighters really has largely failed to materialize. Up until the attacks in Paris in November, the only real manifestation of this was the was very uh, well-known abortive attack abor aboard a high-speed, uh, attempted attack aboard a high-speed trade traveling from Belgium to France that was disrupted by two uh, U.S. military personnel uh, um, and an Englishman. And then, of course, we have you know, the tragic events of November 13th in Paris that killed 130 people and involved 400 others that were indeed perpetrated and were indeed planned and orchestrated by um, foreign fighters. So you can see, though, why there is this tendency to denigrate or dismiss the threat of foreign fighters or even the threat of terrorism in, 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 in general. Um, we're at a time in our history where the United States and its allies are no pun intended, deathly tired of the ongoing wars on terrorism after uh, more than a decade and a half, when our cemeteries and hospitals were already populated by a new generation of battle casualties, when our treasuries have been drained by 14 years of global skirmishes and outright warfare, and when our defense and intelligence budgets are either declining or, as uh, the DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, James Clapper, said at our conference back in September, have been flat um, for some time. So with all these developments, it's tempting to regard the potential foreign fighter boomerang effect as exaggerated, if not alarmist. 
at least I argue, that there's very good reason to heed Director Comey's warning and to resist being lulled into this false sense of security. Um, that the paucity of actual uh, returning foreign fighters to date uh, suggests. In this respect, I argue that an especially virulent concatenation of ideology and ambitions and strategy and sheer numbers that is at the heart of the current terrorist threat posed by ISIS argues compellingly against being drawn into the complacency of denial. In a nutshell, I, this isn't a place to go into ISIS's uh, uh, diverse capabilities, but it bears uh, stating that its size, finance, weapons, and tactics combined with their ability to seize and hold terrain, a meaningful hold, meaningfully hold terrain, and exercise governance over diverse populations, however crude, is arguably unique in the annals of uh, terrorism. According to ISIS, and unfortunately this is a phenomenon one sees in other places in the Middle East, I would argue <coughs> other groups, I would argue that Jabhat al-Nusra, which ridiculously we never associate as Al-Qaeda's uh, Syrian arm, and also um, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, are entities that are now as capable if not more so than some of the standing militaries of the region's established nation states, and that we face a very different threat from what really have become hybrid forces. I mean, it would be incorrect to call any of those three, but especially ISIS, just a terrorist group. I mean, they're a combination of terrorist groups, insurgents, with some very formidable uh, conventional um, military capabilities. Now, Dan will unpack this a bit more, but at least in my view, there have been three preeminent or main arguments uh, presented that basically push back against this view of being concerned about ISIS. Uh, Dan and uh, um, J um, Jeremy Shapiro, an old friend of both of ours, um, in, a, in a very well received, very well researched, um, in fact, meticulously researched paper on the report on the foreign fighters threat that was published by Brookings in 2014, argued that the threat exists, but that it is much lower um, than um, one than one would argue it is for a variety of reasons, and I'll let Dan explain that. Uh, perhaps one of the other preeminent figures, figures in the terrorism studies field, Thomas Heghammer, in a very uh, well-known study of foreign fighters uh, that used a, a database or a sample from 1990 to 2012, concluded that the threat is low. In fact, Heghammer found that only one in nine foreign fighters actually returned from the venues or the locus of conflicts that they had migrated to. But even though it's a very small number, one in nine, he also noted that those who do return are a lot more capable, a lot more lethal, and a lot more difficult to, to deter. Um, and then finally, uh, Brent McGurk, uh, who's uh, currently uh, the coordinator for the White House and the struggle of the International Coali Coalition against ISIS, has argued that the threat of foreign fighters isn't all that large because mainly most of the foreign fighters, when they go overseas, they go overseas to kill themselves and they don't come back. So they're, uh, so they're expended. I think as compelling as the, uh, these arguments may be, and, and they certainly are compelling, but nonetheless, I think, though, that uh, they underestimate and, in fact, are under overshadowed by the vast scope of ISIS's ambitions, the extraordinarily high number of foreign fighters that have answered its battle call, and the movement's own professed ideology and strategy, which embraces an imperative of a divinely ordained ongoing struggle. Along with the intensification of its confrontation with a broad array of enemies, basically ISIS has taken on Iraqi and Lebanese Shia, Iran, the Assad regime, Russia, Israel, uh, the United States, and of course other Western um, powers, so has vast ambitions. But it's also this lethal combination that arguably hitherto has not constrained the group in anything that it has done. Certainly the, the, the cruel beheadings, uh, degrading executions, but also its frequent use of chemical weapons um, illustrate that this is a remarkably late lethal group that really knows very few uh, uh, boundaries. So the reasons, more specifically, why we should be very concerned by this prospect of foreign fighters returning is first and foremost, the number of foreign fighters under ISIS's aegis already exceeds by a factor of 10 the flow of foreign fighters to Iraq at even the height of that conflict. 
So we're dealing with much larger uh, numbers. <coughs> According to a recent report of the United States House of Representatives Homeland Security Committee, the number of ISIS volunteers thus far in 2015, so that report was issued at the beginning of October, um, is more than three times the number of 2014. I'll insert parenthetically, even though this wasn't the subject of my, of my article, this completely blows out of the water any sort of hopes or expectations that CBE programs countering violent extremism are really having any effect given these numbers. In fact, the majority of the estimated 25,000 fighters that have gravitated to Syria and Iraq come from the Middle East and North Africa. Ironically, Tunisia has provided the largest, this is the one country that it seems the roots of democracy and political reform promised by the Arab Spring seem to have taken root and then paradoxically that, that's provided the largest numbers of, uh, of foreign fighters from the, from the region. Um, but its ranks include nationals from some 80 countries throughout the world, including the United States and, and Canada. Among them, too, I think fascinatingly, was Indonesia's Omar Abdul Aziz. Uh, for those who have no clue who Omar Abdul Aziz is, in fact, I didn't, until I delved deeper and discovered that he's the son of Imam uh, Samudra, one of the 2002 Bali bombers. So we now have a second generation of jihadis, motivated, inspired, animated, not just by their fathers, uncles, brothers, cousins, but in many cases, animated by revenge for the death or imprisonment that we meted out uh, to those um, relatives. But back to the main subject, in just four years, ISIS's international cadre has equaled even the most extravagant estimates of the number of foreign fighters who gravitated to Afghanistan under um, al-Qaeda's aegis during the 1980s and the 1990s. Viewed from another perspective, more foreign fighters have been trained by, trained by ISIS and other radical Islamist groups in Syria than by al-Qaeda in Afghanistan during the five years leading up to the 9-11 attacks. The situation in Syria thus creates the same conditions but on a far greater scale and magnitude that led to ISIS, that led to al-Qaeda's rise and the attacks on New York and Washington, D.C. in September 2001. The numbers themselves, I think, are fundamentally uh, disturbing when you're talking about uh, tens of thousands. Uh, the arguments of Dan and Jeremy Shapiro that the potential of boomerang effect of foreign fighters to carry out attacks in the West is lower than the conventional wisdom suggests, I think is completely drowned out by that number. And more so by the ability of ISIS and other terrorist groups that have foreign fighters, and I'll come to that in a second, the ability that they have, they have, a, they have a surfeit of potential recruits from which they can cherry pick and very selectively um, um, operationalize or order the most competent to carry out um, terrorist attacks. In other words, cherry pick the most likely terrorists, the most capable ones to succeed back in their, their homelands. Um, Comey himself cited the Afghan uh, template as, as a harbinger of this. And indeed, if you go back to the 9-11 Commission report, uh, they state quite authoritatively uh, that thousands flowed through al-Qaeda's camps in Afghanistan before 9-11, but only a small number of those were actually hand-picked to receive specialized training and high-level operational assignments, such as the events that unfolded uh, in East Africa in 1998, uh, in uh, Aden in 2000, and then um, in New York and Washington, D.C. Uh, in 2001. Must also be said that Syria and Iraq are today not the only venues where foreign fighters are currently being trained and being welcomed. You have to add to that, so the 25,000 figure may even be a modest one. You have to add to that list foreign fighters being trained in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Libya, Yemen, and Mali, um, amongst um, other places. And this also, I think, underscores firstly the pervasiveness of the foreign fighter phenomenon, firstly that some nationals from some 80 countries throughout the world um, have gravitated to Syria and Iraq, but it's also not just to Syria, Syria Iraq um, where they're growing to. And I think it also underscores that this is a threat that will not be confined to any one um, region or country. Moreover, ISIS's fundamental appeal, what's drawing and attracting these foreign fighters is based on a profound sense of catharsis, empowerment, and cleansing derived from striking a blow against a hated predatory oppressor. This is strictly stuff out of Franz Fanon's uh, The Wretched of the Earth. 
And I would argue it's very difficult to craft a message that counters the satisfaction, the cleansing, um, the, the catharsis of, um, of, of, of violence. Uh, further, the temp as I mentioned a minute ago, the temptation to dismiss these developments as, prim as primarily a local phenomenon confined to the perennially unstable, uh, always violent Levant is further belied by the growing number of ISIS provinces or branches uh, springing up across the region. To date, ISIS has established bases in at least half a dozen countries, stretching from West and North Africa to the Arabian Peninsula and from the Sinai to South Asia um, and the Caucasus. And this, I think, is enormously important. Because much as the franchises and the affiliates sustained and transformed Al-Qaeda throughout the latter part of the, the past decade and enabled Al-Qaeda to survive even the most consequential war on terrorism ever waged uh, against the terrorist entity, so will these branches and affiliates or provinces, as uh, ISIS calls them, sustain that group and endow them with an international dimension and an international attack capability. And just within a few weeks in November after this paper was delivered, we saw that in Sinai, um, in Lebanon with a massive uh, uh, car bombing, and then of course in, um, in um, uh, Paris. Um, to date, there already have been multiple attacks in Turkey, most recent one just a few, a few days ago in Istanbul, uh, outside of, of the Blue Mosque. As well, over the past year, a series of foiled plots uh, in Albania and Kosovo, in addition to three ISIS uh, attacks in Bangladesh and the abortive July 4th plots in the United States, um, referred to by Ambassador Coleman. Why is this happening? And here I think the answer, uh, like both, virtually everything else in this paper, is, uh, is relatively easy. ISIS has appropriated al-Qaeda's uh, ideology and strategy. And in this sense, it's not surprising to find deep ideological commonalities between ISIS and al-Qaeda that have shaped ISIS's strategy and explain why it was so intent on declaring the caliphate um, in June uh, 2014. Like al-Qaeda, ISIS sees itself as its fighters uh, defending the Sunni Ummah against a variety of aggressive uh, predators. ISIS also shares al-Qaeda's unmitigated hostility towards the Western liberal state system, and especially democracy, which it has repeatedly derided in its propaganda as that um, wicked uh, methodology. I would say, in fact, the only ideological differences between al-Qaeda and ISIS is in timing and in the question of the caliphate. Uh, Zawahiri said you have to first <laughs> cleanse these countries of Western influences, once uh, the near enemy has been, uh, once the far enemy has been ex expelled, then you can defeat the near enemy and then you can defeat the caliphate. In Abu Bakr, Bakr al-Baghdadi's view, why wait? Um, we can declare the caliphate now. And there's a brilliant article uh, that was just circulated in the SSP uh, Weekly Brief <coughs> by David Gartenstein, Gartenstein Ross and colleagues that talks about Al Qaeda's employing a Maoist strategy, whereas ISIS is uh, uh, employing a, a focalist one which I think um, is exactly right. And in this respect, ISIS patently thinks and acts strategically, having basically stolen Al-Qaeda's seven-stage victory, to a seven-stage strategy to victory, which was first articulated by um, Saif al adl leading Al-Qaeda operative, someone who was recently uh, released from Iranian um, imprisonment and is playing an active role in the movement. And he first articulated that in 2005. I don't want to keep hanging on, so let me just briefly go through uh, the strategy, because I think that sets up exactly how this struggle has unfolded the way it has over the past <coughs> two years. So according to Saif al writing in 2005, um, first strategy was called the awakening stage, which unfolded between 2000 and 2003 and coincided with the 9-11 attacks in the United States. And this he wrote, he was writing retrospectively, of course, it's kind of easy to look backwards and say, here's our strategy, and this was the first phase that we succeeded in was reawakening the nation by dealing a powerful blow to the head of the snake in the US. So you can check that off. The second phase he described as the eye-opening phase, which took place following the US invasion of Afghanistan, I'm sorry, US invasion of Iraq in 2003 and lasted till 2006. And here he described the purpose of that phase was to perpetually engage and accordingly enervate the United States and other Western militaries in a series of costly, debilitating overseas military ventures. Now we get to the interesting po point, because this is not, no longer retrospective, but it's prospective. So the third phase, according to Saif al 
was the rising up and standing on the feet stage between 2007 and 2010, which entailed Al-Qaeda's proactive expansion into new fertile uh, venues, in this case, West Africa and the Levant. And actually, if you look back at that thimble full of documents that was released by the West Point uh, Combating Terrorism Center um, in May 2012, one of the most interesting documents is uh, Bin Laden memo from about from around this time, maybe even a bit before that, it was actually in 2004, that identifies Nigeria's fertile ground for al-Qaeda's expansion. And you see that this fits into a strategy that is subsequently implemented after the necessary groundwork two or three years later. Uh, the fourth, he described again writing in 2005 as the expansion stage, um, which entailed the exploitation of these new opportunities that would be created by, the, um, by this expansion. Now, this coincided with two <laughs> seminal events. Firstly, the killing of Bin Laden, which in point of fact didn't slow down this process, but gave it new opportunities because of the instability and upheaval that unfolded across North Africa uh, and the Middle East. Um, and also, of course, uh, the, Ar the Arab Spring that just gave uh, new openings that Al-Qaeda, because of this strategy, I would, I would argue, it was well poised to take advantage of, advantage of. And now we get to today, which was the fifth of the seven stages. And this Saifal Adel described as the declaration of the caliphate stage, which he predicted would occur between 2013 and 2016, when Western influence um, would be reduced and weakened, and the beginnings of a new world order would be created. I mean, now we see why o Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was so intent and so anxious to declare the caliphate in 2014, I mean, at the beginning of this process, and basically to steal al-Qaeda's lunch or steal a march on al-Qaeda and go on to implement this strategy. So what do we have to look forward to? Six, Asaif al described describe the total confrontation stage between 2016 and 2020, just in time for the presidential elections which will occur, or could only occur, after the caliphate is being established, and where all these disparate um, uh, Muslim armies, um, affiliates, associates, branches, provinces, spread throughout North Africa, the Middle East, West and uh, East Africa, the Caucasus, the Arabian Peninsula, uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, would all come together to form a quote-unquote Islamic army that would launch the decisive quote-unquote fight between the believers and the non-believers that Bin Laden had often predicted. And finally, he envisioned the definitive victory stage, uh, which would occur between 2020 and 2022 when the rest of the world is beaten down by the triumphant caliphate and victory comes finally um, after years of fighting. Now, as I said actually last night in my 520 class, propaganda doesn't have to be true. It only has to be compelling and it only has to be believed. When you think about it, unfortunately that strategy maps pretty closely to the way that things have unfolded over the past few years. It actually explains, as I said, ISIS's and Baghdadi's in particular uh, desire to declare, uh, to declare uh, the caliphate. Also, too, as a propaganda vehicle, from the jihadis' perspective, things are going pretty much along, right along schedule, which, you know, is encounters us to, to much of the statements that we hear often that, uh, that al-Qaeda itself is on the verge of strategic um, uh, collapse, that, uh, that the ISIS threat is, is much lower than, than we believe it is. I think for ISIS and even al-Qaeda's followers, uh, this is a compelling narrative of achievement and obtainment that accounts for their, um, for their um, continued, uh, continued appeal. So let me you know, sort of cut to the end because I'm going on uh, too long. I would say that the conventional wisdom on Al-Qaeda, generally this war on terrorism has never been right, and it's um, le even less so uh, today. Only a little more than a year ago, amazingly, the conventional wisdom inside the Beltway, and some of you work in various agencies and offices will know that this was very much the case, that it was hypothesized that the bloody spit, split between Al-Qaeda core and ISIS uh, that, uh, that was announced in January 2014 would eventually weaken the overall jihadi movement and even destroy one another in some you know, fatricidal, internecine struggle that renewed both groups. In point of fact, uh, that wishful thinking remains completely unfulfilled. Rather to the contrary, a rivalry, rivalry has emerged that perhaps 
could lead to even greater uh, levels of violence before because of this competition. At least looking historically on the patterns of terrorism throughout the world, splits in terrorist movements and rivals have generally, at least in the short term and sometimes in the medium term, have produced more intense levels of violence rather than uh, diminished ones. So accordingly today, um, we're faced with the prospect of even two <coughs> stronger, more resilient factions competing against one another and both targeting the U.S. and the West as part of that competition. Now, also, some of the conventional wisdom just about two years ago was that the creation of Al-Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent was just a publicity stunt and that there was, there was no substance to this. I would urge you to look at the uh, uh, discovery of a huge Al-Qaeda al base that spans some 30 uh, kilometers in the Shorabak area of Kandahar in October, uh, which is being uh, coll coll colloquially described as the Bat Cave, where there's a collection of Al-Qaeda armaments that rivals its pre-9-11 stockpiling of, and caching of weapons. Um, and if I were a betting man, which I'm not actually, I would say that that's probably not the only such facility in Afghanistan um, right now. There's also uh, another potential. Not only have two groups competing against one another, uh, but something that I've warned about for, for over a year now is the potential, the potential for an eventual reconciliation and amalgamation of the two groups, which I don't think uh, can be um, ruled out. Um, Efforts at establishing some modus vivendi have been ongoing now almost since the time of the split, most recently in the, in the fall during these talks that were held in Idlib in Syria. Um, I think the main impediment to any sort of amalgamation is the intense personal rivalry and uh, intractable um, enmity between Ayman al-Zawahiri, the leader of al-Qaeda, and, and, and al-Baghdadi, the leader of ISIS. Uh, the likelihood that Baghdadi will be killed at some point, I would say, is pretty high because we've almost, we've nearly succeeded in killing him already. But I'm not saying that that's all of that idea. Mankind or humankind would uh, benefit appreciably from his death. But we should be prepared, though, for the second and third order effects, which means with Baghdadi out of the way, with no clear successor to lead ISIS. And of course, part of Baghdadi's claim to leadership is his lineage supposedly dating back uh, to the Prophet. Um, means that ISIS could be poised for a hostile takeover al by Al-Qaeda or even some form of amalgamation. Again, it's very interesting to look at <coughs> ISIS propaganda. I mean, they hate Zawahir. That's, that's clear. But they talk about Bin Laden in very odd, and very laudable tones. They often praise individual Al-Qaeda fighters and emirs. And I would say that, you know, again, contrary to the... Um, conventional wisdom, the differences between the two is much smaller than one thinks. And that was one reason why I went into this disquisition that ISIS has stolen Al-Qaeda's strategy. They're really, uh, ISIS is a version of Al-Qaeda on steroids, uh, far less restraint. So, to conclude, 54 years ago, uh, the famous French intellectual and philosopher uh, Jean-Paul Sartre warned of the boomerang effect in the preface that he wrote to Franz Fanon's uh, The Wretched, Wretched of the Earth. It is the moment of the boomerang, he observed. A new phase of violence comes back on us. It strikes us, and we do not realize any more than we did the other times that it's we that have launched it. More than half a century later, I would argue, we are again confronted by the boomerang. This time from a hard core of battle-hardened terrorists drawn from the thousands of foreign fighters trained and commanded by ISIS, and also by Al-Qaeda's core as well who may at this very moment be awaiting orders to deploy back to their homelands to carry out attacks. Thank you. It's always tough to follow Bruce. Uh, one of the things I uh, insisted on when we were in Jordan was actually to go before him uh, to avoid his uh, When the Paris attacks happened in November, uh, the script that seemed to be followed uh, very much was what Bruce had outlined in terms of his understanding of the threat. And when I give the, my usual talk on foreign fighters, I usually spend the first part explaining the very real danger. Right? So I want to be clear. If I were giving um, a subtitle to this talk, I would say, uh, be afraid, be somewhat afraid. Right? And I think where Bruce and I differ is the, uh, not whether is there a threat, yes or no, but the level of that threat. And I think it comes down to uh, some of the factors that we emphasize in our analysis. 
and, um, and a few differences, but also some that's really just relative weighting. Um, I began my work on the recent foreign fighter trend in Iraq and Syria for, I would say, two reasons. It began about two years ago. Uh, one was a term, uh, you know, as you know, for those of you who work with the U.S. government, uh, uh, brain term to be real, it has to be an acronym, right? And the term was um, uh, FTF, uh, Foreign Terrorist Fighters. And to me, I wanted to separate out the F and the F from the T, right? I want to separate out from the foreign fighters from the terrorists. And I'll discuss why I feel that they're related, but distinguishable for now. But the bigger one was that as I began to hear the concerns, I recognized the echoes of the past. Uh, if we go back in time, 11 years or so, I was going around Europe talking to European security officials about their citizens going to Iraq to fight. Right? They were overwhelmingly concerned about Right? This was going to be Afghanistan and the problems we had in Afghanistan on steroids. And we saw this echoed in the United States by some people who were friends of ours who were very serious terrorism watchers. Um, to a lesser but still real degree, we heard this on Americans going off to fight in Somalia. In France, this was heard on uh, Frenchmen going off to fight in Mali. So we've seen many, many jihads that did not produce a significant problem. So what I tried to figure out simply was, um, why was I wrong when I warned 10 years ago, 11 years ago, that Iraq was going to produce major problems related to foreign fighters? Right? And from there, I was using that knowledge to try to understand the level of danger with Syria. Uh, so let me kind of go through a range of factors to me that take the very real concerns that both Bruce and I share, but also uh, put some other things on the table. Uh, the standard model we often use to think about the foreign fighter danger often comes down to what happened with people going to Afghanistan to fight um, the anti-Soviet Jihad, and then subsequently in the 1990s, training with Al-Qaeda. Um, there are a couple caveats to this, and I'd say two very big ones. Uh, one of the biggest is that the group there, Al-Qaeda, was very focused on the United States, right? America as the head of the snake. And if you wanted to affect change in the Muslim world, which it was very concerned about, you had to get rid of Western influence, and hitting the United States hard was part of that. Um, I'll argue that the Islamic State certainly has that ambition, but that's less of a priority for it. Um, a second thing is that before 9-11, almost no one cared about foreign fighters going to Afghanistan. Right? There was a small group of people in the CIA that were looking at this, among other issues. There were a few people overseas looking at this, but that was it. Right, that this was a problem that no one was seeking to address. Um, and as a result, it was allowed to run rampant in a way that I think has changed. Uh, it, the way I like to think about the foreign fighter problem is, uh, forgive me, I'll put a professor hat on, but is a production function. Right? So how many, if 100 foreign fighters go abroad to fight, how many come back as terrorists? Right? And the headcamera figure that uh, Bruce noted, his kind of meta-study, was about one in nine, okay, which is actually an exceptionally high number. Right? That number should terrify you rather than reassure you. Right? If you're talking about thousands of people going abroad to fight and hundreds come back as terrorists, that's a very, very severe problem. Um, I actually think that number is high. And one of the reasons, as I mentioned, is it includes a very heavy data set from Afghanistan. I feel is quite different. Um, but let me go through the factors that lead some foreign fighters not to come back as terrorists and see what you think. Uh, first, we have a methods issue. Okay, so those of you who are doing your senior theses, uh, you know, pay attention here. Everyone else can fall asleep. Uh, which is, many of those who go abroad to fight are violent individuals. Right? They're people involved in gangs. They're involved in petty crime and so on. Uh, these people would use violence if they were not going abroad to fight it. Right? Now, we call it something else if they put on Islamic State uh, flag on themselves and shoot at people. Right? But it's still murder and mayhem. Right? So we have to recognize that there's a subset of people, some of whom would have used violence no matter what. Right? Um, okay. But let's put those aside. When people go abroad to fight in a war zone, what happens? Well, first thing is many die. 
right? And here's a big difference with Afghanistan. In Afghanistan, the mortality rate for foreign fighters before 9-11 was about 5%, right? That's exceptionally low. It's really an outlier in the foreign fighting world. If you went to Chechnya, it was over 90%. Right? You didn't come back from Chechnya. Um, what is the figure for Iraq and Syria? Very hard to tell. Uh, my anecdotal sense is, is, so far at least, it's about 20, 25%. It's a lag time uh, in terms of reporting and so on. But that's a significant number. Right? So a number of people who go abroad are going to die. Um, some of those who are the most radical stay abroad. Right? So they're enraptured with jihad. They want to fight, the, uh, fight forever where they are. They sometimes want to go from one country to another. So we saw people from <laughs> Afghanistan going to the Balkans to fight, for example. But again, they don't come home. Um, of those who come home, Many have no intention of conducting attacks. The legitimacy of defending your people against a murderous enemy, against apostates, um, is different from attacking your home country. There are a range of legitimate scholars who would say, you know, the fight in, um, in Iraq and Syria, to defending against the Assad regime, kill the Shia, a number of these people would say, amen. Right? People doing that are heroes and they should not then go home and kill people. Right? Now, this doesn't mean that the 19-year-old who's going to do this has read you know, the sermons of every one of these nuanced scholars, but there is a different perception in communities and in the religious establishment about fighting abroad versus fighting at home. Um, some come back, and they're utterly disillusioned or traumatized by war. Right? Now, this is a nasty, nasty conflict. There's a lot of murder, there's a lot of rape, a lot of involved civilians. And unlike in professional militaries, you don't have the structures in place to ensure a certain uh, sense of morale and cohesion. And so many come back and really don't want war again. Uh, when they are there, they are trained primarily to fight wars. Right? Now, if you learn to use a gun, if you learn to set up a bomb, if you learn how to do suicide bombing, those are things you can use for terrorism. It's not that these are distinct skill sets completely. But at the same time, a lot of uh, techniques such as clandestine operations, that has not been the emphasis of what they're learning. Now, for every caveat I've said, I've used the word many. Right? I'm not using the word all. Right? So what you're taking, if you have my 100 people, you're taking some of them out at each step. But you're not taking all of them. Uh, but there are two big variables, if you will, that I think are tremendously important. Right? And the first one is one where I think that Bruce and I disagree slightly, which is the degree to which the Islamic State is focused on the West. Okay? Uh, clearly, it would be delighted to have lots of terrorist attacks happen in the United States. You, you would not want to be an American or European who goes to Islamic State lands. I think we could all agree on that. Um, but the Islamic State has emphasized the idea of what they would call enduring and expanding. That's a constant theme in its propaganda. In that what it wants is to create an Islamic state and to expand it. And it's a different strategy, in my view, than what Al-Qaeda has pursued, which is it's very much about building the state. And if you look at um, Dabek, their English language propaganda organ, and compare it to Inspire, uh, the Al-Qaeda one, the Al-Qaeda one is so much about doing attacks back home. And Dabek is so much about come to the lands of the Islamic State. These can be the provinces of the Muslim world, too. And it very much wants people to come and fight for the Islamic State. Creating that state, defending it, is tremendously important. And it's a very traditional strategy in some ways, right? which is you have territory, you tax, you recruit, you bring in foreign recruits, you use those resources to expand the territory, and you repeat until you win. And that's a different approach where terrorism is used as part of that struggle. So the primary emphasis of terrorism has been on neighboring states, has been on efforts to demoralize the police and security services in the way that revolutionary groups have done for eons, right? where you're going after enemies as part of war. And if you look at what's been happening in Turkey, for example, if you look at Lebanon, uh, the emphasis on neighboring states and bringing them in, to me, is consistent with your idea of a regional strategy and a regional emphasis. Again, I don't want to say they're devoting zero resources to but I think Al-Qaeda was primarily focused on the West in a way that on the Islamic State uh, is much less so. And if you think about the Islamic State's predecessor organizations, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, this was an organization that did not strike the West despite a decade of massive U.S. operations against this, 
right? By the end of the decade, the United States had killed its leaders repeatedly, had devastated 70, 80 percent of its upper cadre, and still did not focus, still focused more on the local and regional effort. Um, a second big variable, and again, this is the difference with Afghanistan, is that now everyone is paying attention. Right? When you talk about the foreign fighter problem, you talk about uh, people coming back from Iraq and Syria, you have, I don't know what the number is, tens of thousands? of people around the world focused on this problem. Right? It's a staggering number, and I will probably say many of them are graduates of the Security Studies program. Uh, and that throughout the intelligence community, in police departments, in allied governments around the world, people are taking this exceptionally seriously. So before 9-11 with Afghanistan, again, you had a handful of people who really were not um, able to do this justice. Now there's a serious question, which is the ratio of intelligence and security personnel to foreign fighters, right? And you know, I certainly don't know the exact numbers, but it's a considerable effort. I think we can all agree on. You know, we spend tens of billions of dollars each year on counterterrorism since 9-11, and, and we have gotten something for our money, right? We, I think many of you in this room know the many problems we've had. But we have gotten the benefit as well. And people are, services are more plugged into local communities. The Homeland Security apparatus is more uh, robust. So there are benefits. Um, I also want to talk a bit about social media. Uh, social media has been a boon to these groups. It enables far broader dissemination of propaganda. I have a, I have a pet peeve. I, I don't think Islamic State propaganda is particularly brilliant. I just think they're particularly brilliant at producing massive amounts of it. Right? That it's, it's everywhere. And it's uh, much more extensive than Al-Qaeda ever was. Uh, but you can also, in particular, use social media to do peer-to-peer -peer recruiting. Right? You can be in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you can gain recruits by talking to your friends back home, encouraging them to come out, you can give them instructions. It's, it's tremendous, a tremendously valuable recruiting tool for the Islamic State. But it's also a counterintelligence problem. Um, way back when, when I was in government, we used to spend a lot of time trying to figure out who is connected to whom. Uh, if you use social media, you are putting yourself into link analysis software. Right? You, are, you are doing that for the government, right? You're explaining who your friends and followers are. Right? And that's almost a dream from an intelligence point of view. It's a tremendous vulnerability. And it's not just a vulnerability in terms of revealing networks. Um, it's a tremendous vulnerability because one of the biggest problems we've always had in counterterrorism is identifying a person who has done nothing yet until they launch the bomb. Right? How do you find the person who isn't on the radar screen? Um, the answer now is often they're a friend or a follower of someone in the Islamic State. It's that they're tweeting about this, that they put themselves on the radar screen. Again, this doesn't mean you automatically find them. And there's a resource issue. But there's a vulnerability as well. Um, in my view, if you, I want to compare briefly the United States, Europe, and the Arab world. In the United States, to me, the biggest danger is not a foreign fighter-directed attack. It's still the lone wolf problem. Right? It's what we saw in San Bernardino. Right? Individuals who are very hard to stop, who are not connected to foreigners, and thus are less vulnerable to intelligence disruption because they don't have as many signatures. Um, this question of uh, how to think about Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State to me here is very relevant. If you look at San Bernardino, this was not a radicalization process that was an Islamic State success. This is an Al-Qaeda success. Right? These people were radicalized by listening to the sermons of Enwar al laki the Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula preacher. Right? And having been radicalized, they then glommed on to the latest cool thing, which was the Islamic State. And I think we'll see that a lot, which is individuals who over time have been flirting with radical causes now embrace the latest one, which is the Islamic State. Um, it's worth pointing out to me, at least to me, that there are some limits to the dangers of lone wolves. Uh, first, again, the Islamic State still encourages people to ingather. <laughs> right? It says, if you can, go to the land of Islam. Go to where the Islamic State rules. And then if you can't, do an attack in the West. Um, some of the lone wolves are, many are untrained, incompetent. Now, you can pick up a gun and kill people, right? But one of the reasons that right-wing terrorists have killed more Americans since 9-11 than Islamist ones is, I would say, proficiency with firearms. Right? It's a greater ability to use violence. And so there's a, a less competence in general. And it's harder for them to do sustained um, attacks as a result. Um, Europe certainly faces more of a danger than the United States, as I think the Paris attack makes clear. Um, much larger numbers of volunteers. 
right? So the United States has, you know, I would say closing in on 200 who have gone. In Europe, we're talking over 4,500. Right? Um, also important, though, is you have very uneven security services in Europe. You have some excellent ones. Uh, French, in general, have been pretty good. Uh, the UK, uh, the Danes are quite good that have often dealt with these problems in the past. Uh, but you have a number of countries that have a large problem and relatively unprepared security services. And it's no surprise to me, and I've been saying for a while in fact, that countries like Belgium are very vulnerable because they're not used to having strong, extensive security services that are active, and they have a huge, huge foreign fighter problem. Um, and Europe also has a coordination issue. Right? One of the very depressing things for those of you who have followed the follow-ups on the Paris attack were the numbers of opportunities to stop some of the Paris attackers. Right? And this makes some of the mistakes before 9-11 you know, seem like nothing. Right? That there were repeated attempts where people were detained, where they were um, on watch lists, on and on, where they were disrupted. And so to me, these people could have been stopped, but were not. Uh, but the biggest risk, just to be clear, is to the airport. Right? You have 25,000 fighters, I shouldn't say from the Arab world, I should say from the Muslim world. 25,000 fighters from the Muslim world. And in some countries you have no security services. Right? You have civil wars. You have the ability of these groups to use foreign fighters to create uh, new jihadist organizations to take existing wars and make them worse. Uh, things like beheadings are becoming, in a way, as suicide bombings were in the past, where they're just a signature of these groups. Um, and I think that the, since I believe the focus of the Islamic State is primarily on the Muslim world, that that's where a lot of their foreign fighters are going to go. And they've already sent them to Libya. Right? I think we're going to see that trend continue. Um, a lot is going to depend on the caliber of the Arab State Security Services, um, which have any weaknesses. Right? And it also is a risk for the United States. Uh, you have things like what happens in Egypt, where the government is deliberately trying to conflate a jihadist Islamic State threat with its political opposition to the Muslim Brotherhood. Right? And it's hard for us to kind of navigate and help the Egyptian government fight one at the same time, um, not be linked to fighting the other. Um, let me say a few words on what I feel should be some policy changes. Um, the biggest problem, as I think Bruce and I agree, or one of the biggest problems, is the sheer numbers of volunteers. Right. This is a staggering number of volunteers. Right? So even if I'm right and the production function is much more limited, it's still a very scary number just because the overall volume is so great. Um, so one thing, of course, is how can you work with communities more to get them to act before you go? Um, I have a particular hatred for the term common violent extremism. Um, I don't know what it means. <laughs> and that's always a bad thing. Um, I would like to rephrase it as stopping terrorist recruitment and that could be a range of things, right? It might be killing the terrorist recruiter in Syria, right? There, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, all hearts and minds. Uh, but one thing I would say in general is the need to engage community. Uh, if you think about who has the relevant information in terms of danger and potential danger, there's a, there are a set of circles, right? The biggest circles for an 18-year-old male would probably be his friends, right? And that's the one to know the most about what's going on. The next circle would be family. The next circle would be community. And the next circle would be total strangers. And if you think about which of these circles is most likely to work with police and security services, it's reversed. Right? Where total strangers have no problem pointing out a danger and calling the cops. But an 18-year-old friend, as we've seen with repeated um, attempts in the United States, say, yeah, you know, he discussed killing a bunch of people with me. You know, Dylan Roof discussed, I'm going to go you know, mow down a bunch of people in a church and his friends are like, ooh, dude. You know, but did they call the cops? No. Right? But that's frankly what you expect from 18 year olds. Right? That's kind of norm for better or for worse. And what you need is some ability to engage communities at a level of trust. And the, you know, the virulent anti-Muslim rhetoric that's starting to emerge in the United States and has certainly been present in Europe is tremendously devastating for this, right? It makes communities more suspicious, less likely to work with police. And you also need an alternative to jail, right? If I'm a parent, and you know, I'm a parent of uh, uh, teenage kids, right? And uh, trust me, uh, you know, they are not always the brightest bulbs, right? <laughs> and uh, with that in mind, they are going to go off and do something stupid. I am 
I would be hesitant to call the police if I knew they were going to end up in jail, especially for the rest of their life. Right? So you don't want the choice to be between jail and um, Syria. Right? You want communities and families to have something in between where they feel they can work um, with security services and have alternative programs. The problem, of course, is that's political suicide. Right? Again, think of this as a production function. Let's say you do this and it's brilliant. It works 99% of the time. Okay? Far better than it ever would. Right? Let's say it does. You still would have to go and say, yeah, this person went through our counseling program and they killed 20 people. Right? And that's politically very hard to sustain when you have the option of throwing that person in jail. Um, one thing I would also stress is one of my arguments, ironically, is that the danger is limited because of strong security services. So it's an argument for funding. Right? It's saying that you solve this problem in part by funding security services. And this may require additional efforts to fund you know, in certain parts of the country. I would say there are certain European security services that need more funding. And to state the obvious, uh, the intelligence sharing, especially within Europe, needs to be improved. It's, it's quite poor. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that uh, there needs to be some degree of domestic resilience. Right? And if I were to say the biggest failure after 9-11 in the United States has been on the issue of domestic resilience. Uh, on September 12, 2001, people would ask me, you know, will there be another terrorist attack on the United States, a significant terrorist attack? And I said, absolutely. Right? Uh, at some point, I'm wrong. Right? And I would say I've been wrong. Right? There have been attacks. And there are a few very scary near misses, right? Ones that really could have gone either way and were not, you know, um, uh, uh, some of the incumbents of the terrorists or locked by passers-by. But it's actually been a pretty good almost 15 years now since September 11th. Yet, fears of terrorism remain exceptionally high, right? And so one of the, I would say, the joys of being a professor is I can decry that. Uh, President Obama was trying in the State of the Union to say, we're going to push against ISIS, but this isn't an existential threat. Right? This isn't going to destroy the United States. This isn't World War III, I believe were his words. Um, that's a very hard message to get across politically. And I think I would ask you all to kind of ask yourself a question, and I'm going to ask it to my class tonight in my first terrorism class, which is, what is an acceptable level of death from terrorism? Right? And I don't think your answer can plausibly be zero. Right? Because, you know, sure, that's the moral answer. Right? I would say that about crime, I would say that about murder, I would say that about rape, I would say that about pollution. Right? But I think we have to accept that to drive that number down dramatically, um, it's very costly and very difficult. And I don't know what that number is, right? It's certainly not 3,000 deaths. Right? And I don't think it's a Paris level attack on a regular basis. Right? But what is the number? And I actually think, again, the last, um, the post 9 11 era has been quite successful in the United States. And I kind of wish we, we, we recognized that even as we prepare for new dangers. So I'll stop there, and I think we both welcome one. taking your time to talk with us. Uh, is it more in your opinion you would say then that the threat for uh, foreign fighters isn't necessarily real or exaggerated, but it's more the capability of these foreign fighters? I mean, you could really, like, I agree with you, is like, what number do you really consider a terrorist threat high? But would it, I guess what I'm really trying to ask is, not, is it not so much that the threat is exaggerated, but the capability to inflict damage on other countries more exaggerated, or is that more real? I would, there's no question in my mind that becoming a foreign fighter makes an individual, in general, more lethal. Right? So you don't want, you know, someone who's already radical to go off to a war zone to fight. That's a, that's a bad thing um, in general. And, you know, one thing that Professor Hoffman has been saying for, I'm not sure how many years, but since I began studying terrorism, right, is that low-level technologies can be used in very dangerous, bloody ways. Right? So it actually doesn't take much to kill that many people. And so I, I think that I wouldn't say capabilities directly, but sometimes I do think they, they have a big chucklehead problem, right? So they attract a lot of idiots and fools. But they also occasionally attract some very competent people. 
right? And so I don't want to dismiss it. And chuckleheads and fools can still pick up a gun and shoot people at an alarming rate. Um, so I, I would say my, my sense is I think there's a conflation of foreign fighters becoming terrorists among people who don't follow this closely, where many of them do not for various reasons. And that, to me, is important to address. Well, I, I think, you know, we disagree on sort of the magnitude and the consequences of the threat in that, you know, on the one hand, I worry about the chuckleheads, you know, the incumbents, but I still think this is part of ISIS and Al-Qaeda's strategy. It's to, it's low cost, these people are completely expendable because morons like the Cernayo brothers or the, uh, or the couple out in San Bernardino, um, they spend no money on training. Even if they are arrested, they have absolutely no operational information to give. And what that does is, I think, fulfill the terrorist, uh, the terrorist organization's goals that are behind it, at least if only in an influential, not an operational sense. Firstly, it repeatedly reveals how we respond, and sometimes we don't, don't respond all that well, sometimes we do, but you know, if you look at some of the Paris attacks, and anybody who knows anything about special weapons teams, I mean, you know, so, some of that was, was quite comical, that uh, people bunching up, getting shot themselves and things. So all these are dress rehearsals for more serious operations. And what always worries me is that this is the low-hanging fruit that they can radicalize, that they can animate and inspire, and that consumes so much of the attention of our intelligence and law enforcement capabilities. To the extent that, I uh, no way of knowing this, but just looking at terrorist strategy in the past, to the extent that they're hoping that this preoccupation with the low-hanging fruit, that we really don't have to worry about, that aren't all that trained, will be at the expense of better trained, I mean, this is exactly the phenomenon in France, actually. If you look at all the reporting in France, it's that the French intelligence services, in the weeks and months leading up to the Paris attacks, were so consumed with the radicalized individuals, the lone wolves, the one-offs, that they miss the big attack. And that, I think, is part and parcel of the strategy that ISIS and Al-Qaeda has pursued. What worries me is that the numbers don't have to be large. That you, if you have a small elite force, basically the terrorist version of a special operations unit, they can cause untold uh, death and destruction. To an extent, you're right that societies are just not resilient against. Um, in 2010, Bin Laden called on his followers and on Al-Qaeda's affiliates and associates, September 2010, to carry out Mumbai-style attacks across Europe. No one could do it. There was absolutely no capability. But that's what worries me about Paris, is I don't think that's a capability that resided in those handful of um, individuals. The other thing that worries me is that, and another point that we disagree on, is even in the case, whether it's ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra, I think that they do certainly, even though both of them now are very intently focused, I mean almost equally so, on Syria, they are looking further afield. I mean, you're quite right about Dabiq being very much focused on, on, on a caliphate, but also, I would say one of the main themes you see in Dabiq is this whole apocalyptic contest that is coming. I mean, this end of times battle between the forces of evil, Christianity, Judaism, Ismaili, Shia, I mean, everybody else, Yazidis, um, and, and ISIS, so that at some point they, they may all be consolidated on state building in Syria, but I think embedded in their DNA is that this coming conflict, which they often talk about, and that means it's not going to be confined to the whole lot. The other thing that worries me, and in this respect, I don't think Jabhat, I mean, the only difference is Jabhat al-Nusra is much more selective, I think, in who they recruit than ISIS, but I think this applies to both of them. I neglected, my, it, 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 it neglected to stay in my presentation is one of the things that made me, that sensitized me, perhaps overly, to the foreign fighters threat, was reading um, um, Theo Padnos, who's the American journalist who changed his name, he used to be Peter Theo Curtis, who was one of the few Americans to actually escape from captivity in Syria, from either uh, Jabhat al-Nusra or certainly ISIS. And he had an interview in the New York Times Magazine about must be about 15 or 16 months ago, um, and he said, and this to me was quite chilling, that the Nusra Front higher ups were inviting Westerners to the jihad in Syria, not so much because they wanted more foot soldiers, they didn't, but because they wanted to teach the Westerners to take the struggle into every neighborhood and subway back home. And that to me, I think, applies equally to ISIS, and we've seen the first manifestation of it in Paris. I mean, 
they don't even have to be Mumbai style attacks. I mean, think back to the attack by Al Shabaab, which I would not put in the, the food chain of terrorists or insurgent groups as the most sophisticated and adept. But nonetheless, the attack on the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi in September 2014 was quite devastating. And again, undermines the resilience that you can walk into a mall and shoot it up, and then there's difficulty in bringing, that, bringing this, this, um, this crisis to a close in a short period of time. Just constantly feeds into the, the threat of recurring terrorism. Gentlemen, can you talk at all about um both our operations and Russia's operations in Syria and how that may be <coughs> helping or exacerbating the foreign fighter threat right now? Well, I think, you know, cynically from uh, Vladimir Putin's point of view, I mean, there's a sizable number of Chechen foreign fighters fighting with ISIS. And I think it's infinitely preferable to kill them in Syria rather than let them come back to the Caucasus or to prolong the engagement in Syria and, and sort of suck away militants in the Caucasus or in Central Asia or down, down to Syria. I think the U.S. and Russia have two different aims. Um, Russia wants to prolong the conflict because the longer it's prolonged, the greater its influence. Um, it's already talking now about, um, where did I read that they arms sales even to Afghanistan? I mean, they're taking advantage of tremendous arms sales opportunities to Egypt. They're portraying themselves as a much more rock-steady friend and ally than the United States is. And as I said, it's re-establishing, re however twisted Putin's logic may be, um, reasserting or re-establishing Russian uh, preeminence or at least influence in the region. Um, and also he wants to back Assad. And I think whatever end game he's looking for isn't to resolve the conflict as we would like to see or see some sort of stability, but basically to ensure that whatever remains from the civil war in Syria is, a, is an Alawite rump that preserves the Russian uh, naval bases in, on, on the Mediterranean. The United States, on the other hand, of course, is, is, I would say, fecklessly trying to achieve some stability or some resolution, which isn't going to happen. So the bottom line is that even though the U.S. intentions are different, I think both sides only serve to prolong the conflict longer, which I think is a bad thing because it means greater radicalization throughout the world, which is very different for any sort of um, you know, domestic counter violent extremism programs to, you know, to counter when Muslims are being killed, come join the fight by you know, all the Western infidels, not just, not just the United States. Uh, I'll add a, a few things. Uh, I, I agree <coughs> strongly with Bruce. Um, Russia initially encouraged uh, many jihadists, if you will, to go to Syria was permissive in allowing them to get out of the country. It's probably better. And I would phrase it, uh, it was uh, clearly Chechens, but also um, Russian-speaking members, um, uh, Russian-speaking Muslims. So Dagestan, that whole area, um, has several thousand, with a huge number were there. Um, when Russia has primarily bombed uh, moderate Syrian opposition forces, which the Assad regime sees as a bigger enemy, but when it has gone after the Islamic State, it's actually been trying to go after these fighters. So in a way, it's taking care of its domestic problems in Syria. I think, you know, rather cynically, but rather ably. Um, a, a few things on the U.S. Uh, one thing about the U.S. air campaign is it, it has killed a lot of people, right? Now, certainly in Syria, to me, it's been largely, almost completely ineffective. But in Iraq, you know, the figure people often use is about 40% of the territory in Shwak, and they've lost a lot of people in those battles the, uh, the Islamic State has. And there's a, those of you who uh, follow the great news source, uh, Duffel Blog, there's a, a, a great piece on, uh, you know, foreign fighter gamer has horrible death to kill ratio. <laughs> <laughs> Goes over there quickly, <laughs> right? So, uh, so these people are dying. Uh, but there's an irony, which is um, one of the keys to the Islamic State's success is that it's been successful, right? And that's, I realize, a bit of a tautology. But part of its recruiting pitch is they're winners, right? These are guys establishing the Islamic State. These are guys who are pushing back against the West in Iraq and Syria. They're fighting the Shia on and on. They have a list of accomplishments. Um, as they start to lose territory, they will be under pressure to have other wins, right? And this is perhaps just a correlation, but perhaps one of the reasons you know, for the Paris attacks was they were suffering losses in Iraq, right? And this is a way of not only striking back and taking revenge, but of also staying in the news and having wins. 
And this is something we've seen repeatedly in the history of terrorism. Right, is groups that are often pursuing other strategies or other approaches, and when they fail, international terrorism in particular has a high, is a high-profile means of keeping themselves relevant and in the news. So even though I favor being fairly aggressive and going after the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, I think we have to recognize that in the short term, at least, it actually may make the terrorism problem worse. Okay. You just outlined the ISIS and Trump strategy. They're winners. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <coughs> great presentations, and uh, and I think there's a great synthesis between between the two perspectives. You know, we hear pundits and politicos and armchair uh, strategists talk about containment and deterrence, and uh, and I wonder if you can say whether you know, any, there's any way to deter uh, ISIS or Al Qaeda or contain them, and that seems to be the the. You know, the clarion call from some people that we, we should just contain them and not, not worry about it. But my real question would be, and, and you started to answer some of this, Stan, with uh, you know, community engagement, things like that, is really how do we attack their strategy? I think the strategy that Bruce has laid out is compelling, and, uh, and so, so how do we really attack the strategy? Because that's really, I, I think, the key, and, uh, and something I just can't get my, get my head around. Um, I'll start. Uh, I'm skeptical on deterrence this one, so I'll stop with that. But on containment, uh, if you think about the Islamic State as it's multiple things, right? So we can range from a cult to a social service provider. But the actual state part of the Islamic State, you can contain and actually think has been contained. Right? The Islamic State is smaller than it was a year ago. Right Now you could make it even smaller. Uh, a lot of what that requires to me is actually building up neighbors. And so that could be Turkey, that could be Lebanon. You work with neighbors to make sure that they're solid, that the danger does not spread further. Um, a big and can be very important issue we haven't really talked about much today, Bruce mentioned, uh, but I did not, was, is the provinces outside of Iraq and Syria. Right? So if the Islamic State loses 5% of its territory in Syria, but oh, by the way, several major jihadist groups around the world join it, that's a net win for it. Right? So we have to think about containment as well as working with other governments that are threatened and effective. And at times where there is no government, as in Libya, you might be working at the local level. You might be working with local militia or tribal forces to push back. So I think you certainly can contain part of it in a military <coughs> sense. Um, I think, I, I used to kind of be a big believer in the war of ideas efforts. Um, I just haven't seen it done well, and I'm not sure I can actually say what the problem is. Right? I think bureaucratically we're just very bad at this. Right? We have some um, websites in government that are so ineffective, the Islamic State doesn't bother to troll them, right? Um, and this is just something that I think um, maybe you could do a little better, but I, I'm, I'm skeptical of containing the ideology, except with the point that, as I mentioned, I think one of their biggest selling points is not um, ideology in a traditional sense, but really just an image of success. And the more we can penetrate that image, the more we can show that this group is actually having problems, the more we can kind of play up, um, you know, fighters who have gone there and have had horrible things happen to them. Uh, those are the images I would emphasize in terms of trying to uh, go after what I feel is one of the strongest points right now. Well, you know, my children say that I'm a curmudgeon. <laughs> and I think I've been studying terrorism too long because I don't, I don't see a way of containing them. I think the situation we're in now is manifestly worse than the one we're in three years ago, but even 10 years ago. I mean, 10 years ago, we had one enemy largely in two places. Well, we created the enemy in the other place. I mean, now we have multiple enemies, or two, two main enemies, but then multiple enemies as well. Um, we don't have nearly the resolve, but also the resources to put against this problem, and our allies are even more anemic than we are. So I don't see any easy way of, of containing it. I think the I always thought that was a myth anyway, and this was part of the argument that ISIS would always remain a local phenomenon. And, you know, and I don't think Dan's wrong, because I think in a lot of their orientation, they are local, but I think what we completely forgot, uh, at the risk of repeating myself, was what facilitated the transformation of Al-Qaeda Al and ensured its longevity, was this whole process of affiliates and, and, and associates that, it, or franchises that it cultivated. 
And it amazes me, there were many people, I mean, many people, there were some people who warned about this with ISIS, but of course it was completely denied that the internationalization, that, that ISIS's uh, accretion of territory, population, power, reputation would ipso facto result in its internationalization. As other terrorist groups or entities self-identified or self-affiliated with them, much as we saw with Al-Qaeda. And that has transformed ISIS, or it's in the process of transforming. Jakarta last night, ISIS just claimed for the attacks on Jakarta last well, night. Well, and the fact that they could recruit people from Indo Indonesia was one of the great success stories in the war on terrorism. There's no doubt. The dismantling of Jamal's Lamia, the diminishment of Al-Qaeda's influence, but you see ISIS can get into, can get into that wedge, and that internationalization, I think, is in the process of making ISIS much more of a, um, of, of, of a global threat. Um, in terms of the loss of territory, again, I think Dan and I, you probably want to take his classes, because he's definitely a, a glass half full person, and I'm definitely a glass half empty. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they lost about 40% of the territory in Iraq, but of course they gained more territory in Syria, including Palmyra, which was a significant, I mean, just for the destruction of the antiquities there. And the enslavement, the beheading of you know the 80-year-old director of uh, the, I mean it's just horrible. And so the, we push them somewhere, they ex they they expand um, elsewhere. I, also, I think you know where they've been pushed out of Iraq, the places that they had a very tenuous control on to begin with. When we conquer Mosul, yeah, or when the Iraqi, I can't believe maybe again my glass half full view of the world. I can't imagine that the Iraqi security forces backed by U.S. air power is going to take on Mosul. I think Ramadi was a much easier target. Also, when you look at Ramadi, it's you know, looking even worse than Berlin in terms of what happened. Uh, I can't believe that, that Mosul will be, they'll be that easily dislodged from Mosul. I mean, that to me is the biggest problem why they won't be contained and why they can't be deterred, is that they're on a roll. We don't want to admit it, but they are. They have achieved what only one other nation state in the entire Middle East has done since the end of World War I, is that they redrawn the boundaries that were fixed after the war. They dissolved the Sykes-Picot, uh, they, uh, they reversed the Treaty of Sevres, and they dissolved the border between, you know, the artificial borders that basically France and Britain carved up the Middle East. Bin Laden always fulminated about it, promised it, but never achieved it. And until that's reversed, I don't think they'll, um, they'll, they'll be contained. I mean, I didn't offer any policy prescriptives uh, in, in mine, which it's probably good because they're fairly depressing ones. Because I think without, you know, without some ground forces somewhere, they're not going to be dislodged and they're not going to be weakened. I think the biggest effect we could have on the diminishment of foreign fighters is, is to weaken and undermine ISIS's power. I mean, they still control 30% of the wheat producing territory in Iraq, for example, which means this gives them tremendous patronage and control because they can feed people. Um, in Iraq until we diminish that, but that's going to take ground forces from somewhere. I mean, you know, I've become s sort of so disenchanted with, um, you know, simple solutions. I don't think there are any simple solutions, so I'm like going out there. Of course, no one listens to me, but that's fine. Kurds, that's part of the solution, firstly. The, the existing order in that part of the world is completely messed up, that we know. Let's at least make one important step to riot. It. it amazes me that there's so much attention, not inappropriately focused on the Palestinians and the plight of the Palestinians and their absence of self-determination and statehood. Well, the Kurds are the largest minority in the world, have been deprived of this you know, for nearly a century. We pay no attention to them, but they're also, firstly, the most capable fighters in that region of you know, nation states or irregulars. Also, I think we need completely different metrics in the war on terrorism. Clearly, the metric of targeted assassination <coughs> isn't working because we're killing lots of them, but it seems lots more people are being radicalized and going. I'm not against targeted assassinations and killing, but I think that's a tactic that we've often conflated to a, to a strategy. Similarly, the other metric is training indigenous forces, and that's been disastrous. I mean, we have almost no successes there. And Iraq and Yemen and other, Yemen was. Again, once, about a year ago, Yemen was seen as one of the real successes of our indigenous training program, and that's completely collapsed. I think the most important metric and the main matter that we can contain ISIS will be preventing the growth of franchises or affiliates or provinces. When we find that that isn't happening with the frequency that we've seen it over the past decade, then we'll know that we've turned a corner in the struggle. If I were a decision maker, 
and I listen to one of you alone, each of you alone, I'd be impressed because you make strong arguments on the position that's being debated. But if I listen to you together, as I have, I'm saying to myself, what should I do? Do I take it, do I, in terms of my resources, resources are both political power, <coughs> military uh, power or might, and, res and, and financial resources, do I take the worst case <coughs> attitude that the foreign fighter threat is real, or do I take it that it's exaggerated? And I need to know, not necessarily from you guys, but if having listened to you, I might then turn to my colleagues in the, if I'm the decision maker in the military and diplomatic intelligence field. So this goes beyond the, the subject, but what would you advise? As a decision maker, do I have to, how do I distinguish what I should do when I've give, been given two very pertinent arguments. Which is safer or which is more prudent, because we're talking about resources and wasting them. Which is more safer or which is more prudent to use? How should I go about this? Should I make the assumption of real or exaggerated? Uh, let me say where I think uh, Bruce and I would agree and where my guess is we disagree. Um, I think we'd agree that you actually should devote considerable resources to this problem, right? Uh, pretend for the moment that my half-full, more optimistic case is correct. Um, part of my argument is it's correct because of strong and resource security services. Right? So to me, if it's a resource question, then um, you need to at least maintain that. Bruce might say increase it more than I do, but I would not you know, favor diminishing that. Um, a big question to me, though, is in rhetoric, right? Which is, I think one of the legitimate complaints the American people had before 9-11, and this is where we got the rather silly, you know, color coding system in terms of threat levels at airports and so on, uh, was that a small group of people knew there was a big problem, and no one else did, right? That there was kind of a mini war going on and a big danger going on, and it was a surprise to almost everyone else. Right? And so a question to me is, should a president be saying this? Right? Should be actively saying, you know, we are, a war footing might be too strong, but we're moving down that road. Or, as Obama has done, should he be actually trying to push people back from that? Right? And I think I would actually favor trying to kind of push people back from it in some ways, even as you devote resources, and I'll let Bruce make his own case on this. Well, we weren't, we weren't being taped, I'd phrase this differently. But <laughs> I'll quote uh, the famous uh, Attorney General under the Nixon administration, John Mitchell, who said, in much more colorful language, if you have to eat the fecal batter sandwich, you want to do it in one bite. Mm -hmm. And that's the trouble with counterterrorism. <coughs> if you're going to go, you know, the longer these things are prolonged, what are terrorists or guerrillas or insurgents fighting? A war of attrition. That's, they know they're not going to defeat us. Of course it's not an existential threat. I mean, that's complete nonsense. And they know it. They don't, they're not going to defeat the United States military on the ground. But throughout history, all terrorists and insurgents know that they always come up against smarter, um, stronger powers. You're going to exhaust them, you're going to enervate them, you're going to wage this prolonged war of attrition. We're already in, in it, into it now a decade and a half, and I don't really see the end. This goes back to the question about you know, Syria and you know, the Russian and U.S. approaches, but the, the end result is it's going to be prolonged, which clearly plays into the strategy of our opponents. So if we're going to do something, let's be decisive and end it. But the United States, of course, throughout its recent history, at least in getting involved in conflicts, is fixated on graduated escalation. But I think with terrorism, that's a real mistake. Um, that's the first point. The second one is that, you know, I, I do disagree. Again, this is my crankiness uh, more than anything else. But I do disagree with, with Dan about casualties. From my point of view, damn right, I think one American that dies from terrorism is one too many. And I think the people serving now in law enforcement and intelligence, I mean, this is very much 
their ethos and their approach, that they're going to prevent every attack in this, in, in this country that's possible. And it's not realistic to mention that the terrorists will be successful. But I think, you know, we, we shouldn't become more resilient. We shouldn't have a, a threshold of pain, because any of these things is horrible. And I even think the resilience is a complete myth that we tell one another, you know, to sort of console ourselves that there's a different way. Look at the, the, the rea and forget about the resilience of the American public. Let's talk about the resilience of the United States government. Look at the aftermath of the Boston bombing. When the U.S. government shut down the entirety of Boston and its suburbs in Logan Airport, and that was basically, you know, a guy in his 20s and his teenage kid brother who downloaded a recipe to make a bomb for the internet. And this is why I get so worried about foreign fighters, because the professional terrorists out there must be looking at that and saying, my God, if these <coughs> idiot teenagers can do this, imagine what we can do. Even in Israel, and I spent a lot of time in Israel in 2003 when I was actually researching suicide terrorism. I mean, that's probably the most resilient society in the world because they've been in a state of war one way or another, but particularly against terrorists since, uh, it's, since its founding in 1948. And yet the suicide terrorism was on the verge of bringing Israel to its knees. I mean, you'd go to downtown Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, it was empty. In fact, you couldn't walk into a restaurant. You had to knock on the door and someone came in if you didn't look like a suicide terrorist. <laughs> Just to say, well, if you didn't look Palestinian or you weren't wearing some bulky clothes, although in the winter that got a bit difficult, they'd open up the door and let you in to eat. So I think, you know, sort of saying, uh, you know, it, it, that um, we don't have to take the threat that seriously because the threat isn't that great plays into the terrorist hands. I mean, if we're serious about countering ISIS, um, we should have a decisive strategy. It may not. <coughs> The American public doesn't have the stomach. We probably don't even have the forces to launch yet another invasion. I'm not arguing that. But what we're doing now is just a, a, a attacking the, pro, the, the problem incrementally. And it will get worse for that reason, because it locks us then into a spiral that plays into the terrorist hands, and, or the insurgents' hands, and their age-old strategy of attrition. I wanted to ask uh, specifically about the Mumbai-style attack and the barriers or in terms of capabilities or will that prevent ISIS or Al Qaeda from carrying that kind of thing out, is it the lack of someone like the ISI to help call the shots and plan the attack? Is it a lack of will or interest currently? What, what would prevent that, and how can we best prevent that? Well, when you look at the you know the pedigree to the Mumbai attack, the attackers were trained pretty ex and they're trained by the ISI, or at least they were trained by Pakistani by groups that had close ties with. With Pakistani, uh, with the Pakistani military, so I mean they were getting very serious training. They were being turned into elite forces, and also if you read about the plot, even the way that they were infiltrated, um, you know, it was, it was quite sophisticated across the board. So I mean, you have to have the fighters and the commitment, and then you have to have the command and control. Um, I think it's a matter of access, you know, Pakistan and India, neighboring countries, so you could get on a boat in Pakistan. I mean, you could also hypothesize you can get on a freighter somewhere in the world and sail into an, an American port, potentially, and also, we'll see that this is probably more difficult, but you, you could envision that. So a lot of it is having to train fighters. I think that was also, you know, what made Paris so devastating is that some of the attackers certainly made mistakes, but at least these were people who were disciplined in their use of weapons. And also there was a command, we know now, just like Mumbai, command and control was being exercised by people in almost a real time uh, fashion. I suppose in the United States context, what worries me is not even so much the U.S., but people coming across the borders. And of course, both our northern and southern borders you know, are not hermetically sealed off. And that's, you know, that's potentially an enormous problem. I mean, look at Canada. Canada has a, a tenth of America's population, and 80% of Canada's uh, population is within 10 miles of the United States. And they've sent at least as many, if not more, foreign fighters to Canada. They also have very different legal authorities and abilities to monitor and track people in the United States. I mean, Mexico, just the flood of illegal immigrants, um, suggests that infiltrating those people into the United States, I mean, I don't expect, uh, you know, the lone wolves would not probably have the discipline and the training to do something like Mumbai, something like the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, definitely. Um, some, San Bernardino, I think, you know, was only, a, you know, we have no idea what they were about because they shot up his place of work and then drove around for four hours before they were apprehended. But that's the point. They did drive around for four hours. They could have gone someplace. They could have gone to a mall and done, done a Mumbai. But, um, so that, that threat exists, but also I still would think that it, the United States, even though, as Dan accurately said, you know, we have far more uh, customs and border patrol. We have 
you know, revamped our domestic homeland security. Of course, we have far more people working on it. But at the same time, the problem has become exponentially greater. It was a more, it was a very challenging, but a more modest problem after 9/11. I mean, basically, it was bad people or foreigners coming from overseas to carry out attacks here. I mean, since then we have the problem of lone wolves, homegrown, uh, inspired extremists, but also people potentially infiltrating the borders, and maybe Americans as well, that may or, or, or have been resident here. So, yeah, we have more people, but the threat is also bigger. And at least, you know, from my perspective, when I spent 14 months working at the FBI as part of this commission, I mean, they didn't think they had enough resources. I mean, just the manpower that they have to put against even these low-hanging threats of a radicalized individual to track them, or at least to identify and assess what the threat is, and the, the multiplicity of, of, of cases they're opening up. I mean, this, again, is part of the terrorist strategies, completely overwhelm us, and then hopefully the more professionals can sneak in. Okay, would you like to make a last comment? We've I'm reached our question. time. So I'd like to thank uh, our two great professors for a great first uh, session, and I look forward to the rest of the time.